Good evening, everybody. In this class, as most of you know, um, we are studying the Gospel of John, and tonight we plan to cover verses 18 through 27 of chapter 11. Always in this class, we start with a little bit of review, and I have, again this week, compressed the review, um, just a, a few slides, so hopefully it won't take too long. But let me go through this and remind you that the Gospel of John is one of the books in the Bible, one of the four books that we call Gospels. Most everybody knows we have the Gospel according to Matthew, to Mark, to Luke, and to John. And each of the Gospels, including John's Gospel, is in some sense a biography of, of, of Jesus, but it is a certain kind of biography. It's a narrative of, of the life of Jesus. There are other kinds of biographies. This one, these Gospels sort of tell the story of his life um, and use that as a way to help us understand about who Jesus is. The Gospel according to John is not the only book in the Bible written by John the Apostle. Um, there are thought to be five that were written either by him or under his authority. The others are 1, 2, 3 John and the Revelation to John. Um, all of the Johannian books so-called were written late in the first century, which means that they were written after uh, most of the other books that we have in the New Testament, so their perspective is, is a little bit later. And uh, John, you can see, sometimes seems to be aware of some things that are contained in, in the so-called synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and sometimes that's important to notice. Like all of the books in the New Testament, the gospel according to John was originally written in Greek and has since been translated into many languages, including Japanese and English, which we use both of in this class. The gospel was written, it's thought primarily to people who are already were Christian believers, um, would have included some who had been Jews, Jews by background and some not, some Gentiles. This first slide in, in my review covers six chapters, so I've got six chapters down to one slide. Obviously, when you do that, you miss a lot of important stuff, but this may at least remind us of the flow of what's happening in John so that we understand you know, our current study better. The Gospel of John begins with an important prologue or introduction where among other things we're reminded that Jesus is what John describes as the word become flesh. In other words, Jesus was a human being as we are, but he was also unlike any other human being who's ever lived or ever will live with God in the beginning, doing what God did in the beginning. So Jesus was man and also God. And it's, as I always remind us, it's really hard to understand what's happening in John's gospel if you long lose sight of the fact of who Jesus is, being both God and man. Jesus was sort of introduced to the world around the age of 30 by a guy named John the Baptist, um, who was famous in his own right. Many people came from all over um, uh, Judea and, and Galilee and, and other parts of Palestine to be baptized by John in the Jordan River. But... When Jesus appeared on the scene, John introduced him, and then Jesus quickly, his ministry surpassed that of John. Um, Jesus performed many amazing signs. John did it. Um, and his, as I said, Jesus' ministry sort of surpassed John's. Jesus became so popular that he attracted the attention of the Jewish leadership, some but not very friendly. And so in chapter 4, it seems that what's happening is that Jesus is sort of retreating from Judea where he's attracting a lot of attention from the Pharisees and heading back to his home uh, country of, of Galilee. En route, he naturally passes through Samaria where in chapter four we read the story of the time Jesus met the woman by the well in Samaria and she and a lot of her fellow Samaritans were able to recognize Jesus as what they called the savior of the world. This despite the fact that so far as we can tell, Jesus didn't do any miracles in Samaria, only they, they talked to him which may be important for understanding what John is doing overall in his gospel. In chapter 5, we read of the time when Jesus left um, Galilee and came down to Judea, down to Jerusalem for a festival. And while he was there, in chapter 5, we read the story of how he healed a man uh, who had been unable to walk for 38 years. A very great miracle. And yet, despite the beauty of the miracle, the Jewish leadership um, is 
is upset with Jesus because he did that on the Sabbath day. And also they're upset, John says, they began to hate him because of the way he described his relationship with God. Jesus described God as his father in a way that nobody else had ever really spoken of their relationship with God. And for those reasons, because Jesus worked on the Sabbath and because of the way he, 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 he described his relationship with God, he became the focus uh, of plots to, to put him to death from that point forward. Back in Galilee, as we read in chap chapter 4 and, and, and 6, um, crowds followed Jesus around, big crowds. Uh, we know, for example, the story of the feeding of the 5,000 were 5,000 men plus their wives and kids, which would have been a lot more than 5,000 people in total, came around Jesus and Jesus fed them um, with only five barley loaves and two small fishes, another very great miracle. He did other things. He walked on water and, and people followed him, but Jesus said to the crowds, you're following me for, for the wrong reason. They were following Jesus because they expected things from him um, which he hadn't really come uh, to give them. Uh, their, their understanding of who he was as the Messiah was still, still wrong. So that's a, a very quick review of, of the first six chapters of John. And by the end of chapter six, if you'll remember, everyone had sort of turned away from Jesus. His signs were attractive, but his teaching was hard. They couldn't accept it. And so at the, by the end of chapter 6, it seems that only the 12 disciples were still uh, with Jesus. In chapters 7 and 8, <coughs> we read of the time when Jesus finally um, abandoning his home country uh, of, of Galilee and, and knowing full well that down in Jerusalem and Judea that, that the leadership is, is not... Uh, not happy with him. He nevertheless knows that it's time for him to sort of relocate his ministry, actually permanently, as, as John's Gospel tells it, down, down to, to Judea. He goes down, the occasion of his going down, uh, we read in chapter 7, is the Feast of Tabernacles, and Jesus goes down and he, in the middle of the feast when everyone is sort of in Jerusalem. He stands up in the temple and he begins teaching, and people are as impressed by his teaching as they have been by his signs and miracles. And the leadership continues to be uh, you know, antagonistic towards Jesus. Nevertheless, a very great miracle and puzzle is that for all this time that Jesus teaches openly, he's never arrested, he's never apprehended, he's never put in prison because God is preserving him until the time comes for Jesus to be, to be crucified. In chapter 8, uh, there's, there's a brief sort of sidestep where John retells the, the, the very well-loved story of, of the the time people brought to, to Jesus a woman caught in adultery, and then he returns to hit the main thread of his narrative description of Jesus' life, which is the continuing teaching by Jesus in Jerusalem during or just after the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's kind of a rough summary, but I, I would say that all of those teachings all the way to the end of chapter 8 are things <coughs> that help the reader understand who Jesus is and the uneasy relationship that he has with the Jews in general, with the Jewish leaders in particular, which is kind of capped off at the end of chapter 8 where we read that Jesus had to hide himself from the people that wanted to throw stones at him. Then in chapter 9, the whole chapter is about um, the time that, that Jesus gave sight to a man who had been born blind. And this is a story that we spent four or five weeks discussing in this class. It's, it's probably, you know, I hope it's a very important story considering the amount of time we spent on it. Um, and it, just a, in a one paragraph sort of recap of that very important story, um, Jesus and his disciples were walking. They pass a man who, who was born blind. Um, Jesus heals him. The man himself is, is rather quickly able to understand that Jesus is a man of God, otherwise how would Jesus have been able to give him sight, which he had never had since the time he was born. The man's neighbors are also amazed, they take him to the Pharisees. The Pharisees pretty much admit that this is an almost unparalleled miracle, and yet they're divided in how they should think about Jesus, because on the one hand the miracle is very great, and, and some of the Pharisees say, well, a, a sinner wouldn't be able to do something like that. But on the other hand, Jesus, once again, as he did back in chapter 5, is doing a great miracle on the Sabbath day, which they thought was inappropriate. 
And again, Jesus is describing himself in ways that they find appropriate. So finally, because this man who Jesus has given eyesight to sticks to his story, they're sort of grilling him. He says, I can't believe you guys don't realize that this man Jesus is from God, considering what he's just done. They put the man out of the synagogue, the man who had, who had, had his sight given to him. And then Jesus finds the man again, and he explains to him more fully who he is. He says, I am the son of man, and the man believes him, and worships Jesus. And I think John is trying in chapter 9 to contrast this man who was born blind and received his sight, both physical and spiritual, from Jesus with the Pharisees who despite their great advantages, their wisdom, their knowledge, their, you know, their, uh, their piety, are unable um, to accept uh, who, who Jesus is. Right? So that's what we have in chapter 9. Chapter 10, this just the last chapter before the one that we're in. Again, we spent probably two or three, at least maybe three weeks on this. Jesus continued after rebuking the Pharisees at the end of the previous chapter. He continues speaking to them through much of, of chapter 10. And the way he's speaking to them is using a figure of speech of a sheepfold that is an, an enclosure containing sheep. And Jesus describes it as having a door, a single door that the sheep and shepherds go in and out through. And then after he's made that word picture sort of to use, Jesus applies it to describe himself. Um, first of all, he describes himself as the door of the sheep. And we, we understand that Jesus' point is that there's only one way into and out of the flock of God's sheep, the kingdom of God, and that is Jesus, who is the door of the sheep. And then after, then he uses the same picture in a different way to describe himself as the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And he says, I call my sheep, my sheep know me, I know them, I lay down my life for the sheep. And he says other things like, no one can snatch my sheep from my hand and, and I have other sheep that are not of this flock by which he teaches that he has not just Jews but Gentiles in, in the kingdom of God. It's a very powerful image that Jesus creates and uses, you know, effectively in, in John recounts. And the Jews, you know, are listening to this, the, including the Pharisees, and they finally say to Jesus, well, are you the Messiah or not? Right? Rather, put it to him rather straightly, he said, they say, tell us plainly, are you the Messiah or not? And Jesus says, I have told you plainly, and you haven't believed me because you're not my sheep. So there again, the image of the sheepfold helps Jesus to, to help us to understand what's happening here. Some people hear Jesus' voice and believe it, and some people don't. And, and one way to think about that is the ones who hear it are his sheep, and the ones that don't are, are not his sheep. That teaching ends with Jesus saying, the Father and I are one. And again, the Jews, as they did once before, and I guess it was chapter 8, near the end, here again at the end of chapter 10, they pick up stones to throw at Jesus because they say that the way he's putting himself forward is as if he were God, the Son of God, they think that it's, it's blasphemy, right? And so, again, Jesus has to remove himself from, from, from their, their, host, their hostility. This time, he does that by crossing over the Jordan River to the eastern side of the Jordan River. And, they, and then John says that was the place where John the Baptist had been baptizing in the beginning. So, again, we, this isn't the best map, but it's the only one I have. Um, <coughs> Again, we see that the area where this whole 10 chapters of drama you know, has played out. This is Jerusalem here. Here's, the, here's Judea. Here's where John was baptizing it at first. Bethany across the Jordan. Here's Jesus' home country of Galilee. There's the city he, he grew up in, Nazareth. Right. And so, you know, Jesus has been here finally. He's come down to Judea. Whenever he's in Judea, he's met with hostility. Most recently, at the end of chapter 10, he's had to take himself out of there because they were going to throw stones at him. And he's over here, back where the story began, sort of, with John the Baptist. When John the Baptist was still alive. John is dead now by the end of chapter 10. But Jesus is there. And because John had been there before, People understood about Jesus from John and were told there at the end of chapter 10 that many people believed in Jesus because of what John had been doing there. Um, one, just a couple more things to review because um, I think that this is handy and I, I took the time to kind of make these slides. Many people who 
teach the book of John will we'll say that the first 11 chapters or so is, is sort of all about the signs. It's the part of John's gospel where the signs are laid out. And, and the people who count them up, will count, they'll say that there's seven main signs that John wanted to talk about. Of course, there's a lot more things, amazing stuff that Jesus did. And, and John, like all the gospel authors, picks the things that he wants to talk about to tell the story he wants to tell so that his readers can understand Jesus the way he understood Jesus, right? If, if you were going to tell a story about your own father or some person who you idolize, and you couldn't tell all the things that you know about that person, you, you, you'd have to pick the things you want to say about the person to communicate the, the character and, and personality and, and, you know, the, of the person you're trying to describe. John picked seven things at least to describe the signs and miracles that Jesus did. And as I pointed out before with a similar slide, although I, I corrected the spelling thanks to Steve, <laughs> yeah. um, is that, that almost all of the signs that Jesus has done in which John has recorded in, in the first 10 chapters, 11 chapters, took place either in Galilee, where, up, up above where Jesus grew up, where they knew him and, and he had lived the first part of his life, which the Bible doesn't talk much about. Or they took place down in Judea, around, especially in Jerusalem and in the temple, the, the heart of, 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 of Israel, uh, where, where the leadership was. Very few signs and miracles took place in Samaria, even though many people believed Jesus there, or across the, in, the, in Bethany, across you know, the, the, the Jordan, if you remember that map I just had up, where Jesus didn't do any signs and many people believed him there. <laughs> but in his home country and in the, in the heart of Israel, where he did many signs, people really weren't believing him. And so of the seven signs, four of them, um, took place in Galilee, changing water into wine. That was the first one when, when Jesus, at, right after he was introduced to Israel by John the Baptist and Jesus, it, disciples started to follow Jesus and they went to a wedding where his mom was and she told Jesus, they're out of wine and finally he changed water into wine. In chapter four, a little bit later, after he returned from his trip through Samaria and got back home to Galilee, there was a son of an official from Capernaum who was near death and he came over to Jesus and said, please heal my son. That was the second sign, also in Galilee. And then, two that almost everybody remembers, the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on water, both in chapter 6. All four of those happened in Jesus' home country. And despite all of that, as I've already said, by the time you get to the end of chapter 6, having, with all the people having seen these great signs, almost everybody except the 12 disciples have rejected Jesus' teaching. And now, starting in chapter 7, the whole drama shifts down for the rest of John's Gospel down near Jerusalem. <coughs> and so far already, we've, we've read two signs there, the healing of the man who couldn't walk for 38 years, and the giving to the sight to the man who was blind from birth, chapters 5 and 9. And now, just last week, we started the seventh and final sign, which is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Okay. And there were... In addition to these, there are other things that, that you might also call signs. It depends on how you want to define the sign. For example, the cleansing of the temple, the fact that Jesus keeps escaping capture on the part of the Jewish leadership. These are also, to me, equally miraculous you know, things, but they're, they're not always counted as, as signs per se. But whether you're in Galilee or whether you're, you're in Judea, people are rejecting Jesus and his teachings. And finally, as we know, it's kind of the central point of the whole Bible, they're going to put Jesus to death on the cross. And one of the things this class will continue to revisit is the question is, why did they need to kill Jesus? Why were they angry at Jesus? What's happening with all of that? But I've set that question aside recently because I want to digest the last, and, and in some ways for John, the greatest and, and most important of the signs because to John, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, that's kind of like a line... In, in the sand. Now, nobody can sort of ignore Jesus. You know, you're either going to have to sign up to follow Jesus, which not many people do, or you're going to have to kill Jesus. But you can't ignore Jesus because only God raises the, raises the dead. And that's what Jesus is fixing to do here in, in chapter 11, as, as we'll be reading. All right? and so let me, in somewhat more detail, let me just quickly remind you what we studied last week. In chapter 11, we just started... All of chapter 11 is about the raising of Lazarus from the dead. You can read ahead and see that. 
And we learned there in the first couple of verses and also in verse 5 that Lazarus was from a village named Bethany. Uh, you figure out if you sort of look back and forth that this Bethany where Lazarus is from is one that's close to Jerusalem, not the one across the Jordan where Jesus is right now in the, in the story. There's two villages named Bethany, one where Jesus is and one where Lazarus was from. There are other Bethanies also, I think. <coughs> so he's in the one near Jerusalem. And this Lazarus, uh, we're told, although probably a lot of John's readers might have already known, we, we're told that he is the brother of Mary and Martha. And John gives us some more information and lets us know it's the Mary and the Martha, which Luke also remembers, the one, you know, when, when Jesus came and Martha was busy and Mary stayed with Jesus, and you, you remember that story. So they, these were two women who were well-known to the early church, well-loved by people even now who, who, who read their Bible. And they're the sisters of Lazarus. So these are the characters, Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha, and we know that Mary and Martha have good character and they have this loving relationship with Jesus, all this we know. And it's important to know that, by the way, that these, these are the characters involved in the story. So this Mary and Martha then sent word to Jesus across the Jordan River. They sent word to Jesus that Lazarus is sick. That, that they, they did in verse 3. And then when the news arrives to, to Jesus, as I just said, he's on, on the other side of the Jordan River. We just read that near the end of chapter 10. In another village named Bethany, probably, as you can read in chapter 1, verse 28. And if you do the math, you'll, f you'll figure out that, that Lazarus was already dead by the time Jesus got the news. And Jesus makes it obvious from what he says that the news is not news to Jesus. In fact, Jesus has supernatural knowledge of the situation um, and what's, what's about to transpire. When Jesus heard the news, I just am repeating verse 4 here. You can read it in your text also. When Jesus heard the news, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It's for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So this shows that Jesus, remember, they don't have internet or telephones or anything like that, right? So the only way he can know this is supernaturally. And it shows that he has a knowledge of Lazarus' situation and also he knows how the whole deal is going to play out and, and why, all right? So this, what's coming is not going to be a surprise to, to Jesus. He, he knows this ahead of time. And that may also explain why Jesus didn't just rush off, you know, to, to people wonder why Jesus didn't leave right away. And one of the reasons is he knows Lazarus is, is already dead and he's going to raise him from the dead when the time is right. So it's two days after he receives the news concerning Lazarus that Jesus finally proposes to return to Judea. And I say return to Judea because you remember, and his disciples remind him in, in verse 8, we just came from there. We just fled from Judea because they were throwing stones at you. We, we came over here. Now you want to go back, they say to Jesus. And then Jesus answers them somewhat cryptically. You can, you can read it there for yourself. He said something very similar back in, in chapter 9, verses 4 through 5. And I don't propose to spend more time on it tonight. But at least what that means there in verses 9 through 10 of chapter 11 is Jesus is saying, yes, I do re intend to return to Judea. And I, and I know that it's risky. I mean, you're not telling me something I don't know. So Jesus knows that it's risky and he's going to go back. Uh, regardless of whatever else we could say about, about those two verses. So regardless of his, uh, of it, you know, regarding his reason for going back to Judea, um, Jesus and his disciples didn't have a discussion. Um, and, and again, there's, we spent a long time last week dissecting this discussion, but if I could summarize it, is that after the discussion is finished, verses 11, 12, 13, and 14, Jesus and his disciples talking, as a result, it becomes clear to his disciples that Lazarus is dead, Jesus says he's dead, and that Jesus means to go wake him up. I don't know if they understand yet what Jesus means by wake him up, but that's the reason Jesus gives for deciding to go back to Judea where it's dangerous. Right? And Jesus then says in verse 15 that he's happy that he wasn't there when Lazarus died because this is going to be some benefit to his disciples. Bear this in mind. Right? I mean, Jesus isn't happy, it seems clear from as we read through the story. He's not happy anybody died. He's not happy that Mary and Martha are sad. None of that makes him happy. In fact, we're going to see Jesus weeping here and wonder what he's weeping about. 
But here in verse 15 of chapter 11, he says there's one thing that brings him joy, and that is that this is going to benefit his disciples and, and help their faith in him, because he knows what he's going to do. So then one of the disciples, Thomas, who is pretty famous later in John, speaking for all of them, I would assert. I th you know, sometimes Paul, um, Peter sort of speaks for all of them here. I think Thomas sort of speaks for most of them. And he's sort of acknowledging the danger and agreeing that they're going to go back anyway. So Jesus and his disciples proceed then to, to the Bethany that's in Judea. And when they arrived, we were told in verse 17, the last verse of last week's lesson, when they arrived in Judea, they discovered that Lazarus has been dead for four days. And of course, that's not news to Jesus, but it probably is to his disciples. And that's where then tonight's um, reading begins in chapter 18. Very, very, very quick uh, review of more than 10 chapters of John. Does anybody have any question or comment? To, we want to pick up now. Okay, if not, we'll, we'll read on. If uh, somebody, Kenzie, you want to read 18 through 27. <laughs> シオ、もしあなたがここにいてくださったなら、私の兄弟は死ななかったでしょう。また生きていて私を信じる者はいつまでも死なない。あなたはこれを信じるか。あなたはイエスに言った。主よ、信じます。あなたがこのように来たるべきキリスト、神の御子であると信じております。ありがとうございます。And somebody likes to read. Steve. From verse 18. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Okay, thank you. And, you know, listening to Steve read, it, it, it um, reminded me to remind you of something. You know, when he put a lot of... Um, emphasis into his reading, right? And that's one interpretation of, of what it means. I think, I think Steve has it right, pretty much, but j just when you, when you study the Bible, remember, the intonation that you have sometimes is the meaning that you get, right? And so, so you could read the same words in an angry way, or in a puzzled way, or in a sad way, or in a hopeful way, or in a cynical way. The Gospel of John is ironical, almost front to back. That's his writing style. Oftentimes he's saying one thing, full well understanding that his readers know more than the characters do, you know, and, and, and so forth and so on. And so, you know, when, when you read, you, you have to, to, to ask yourself sometimes, what did they mean, or what was the nuance, what was the emotion there? And a couple places tonight I want to do that, which is why I mention it now. All right, so verse 18, 
Do First husband. verse for tonight again says Bethany was <coughs> near Jerusalem, about two miles off. Right. So this just reconfirms what I've already said last week. I think you can deduce in several ways that the Jesus destination, where, where he's going back to, okay, is <coughs> Lazarus's village, which is deep in the heart of, of Judea. Right. It's it's just a couple of miles. We will read from Jerusalem which is where the people recently have been seeking to throw stones at Jesus, right? Um, and it's very near Jerusalem, which is where, and pretty soon, in time-wise in, this, in, the, in the gospel narrative, they're going to apprehend Jesus and nail him to a cross, right? And so he said, him back into a place that's recently been hostile, and it's towards the place where he's going to be crucified. And John has that very much in mind now. So this last sign is kind of the hinge point where Jesus is crossing back into Judea and Jerusalem on the way to the cross, right? This is the early, early part of the Passion, in, if you could say that. Okay. And then the next verse says, And many of the Jews had come to, Mary, uh, to, sorry, to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their, their brother, right? So this continues the thought of the previous verse, just making sure that we understand not only are they going into the heart of Judea, but they're going to some place where there's going to be many Jews, okay? It's the same Jews, the Judean Jews, right? Jews from Jerusalem, probably including a lot of the Pharisees and others who have recently been persecuting Jesus, were there, okay? They're, 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 it's easy to walk a couple of miles to Bethany and Judea from Jerusalem. It's likely that the people assembled there are the same sort of people who have recently been persecuting Jesus. So that's worth keeping in mind, too. Remember, Jesus said, nobody takes my life from me, I lay it down. He said, no trouble for three and a half years of age, capture and arrest, but now he's walking right into it. He's walking into the place among the people where he's going to be crucified. That's who's there. Okay. Right. Um, at the same time, I, I think it's worth noticing that just because we know that Jesus has this uneasy relationship with the Jews in general and the Jewish leadership in particular, it, it doesn't mean that in, in a sort of, in every sense that we should regard these Jewish people as, as evil or anything like that. I mean, the fact that they're there to console the sister, the two sisters of, of, of a brother who, is, who has just died, is it's it's a, a good thing it's it's a godly thing it's something that scriptures require okay and there's no reason to doubt there's no reason from what john writes to, to doubt the sincerity of these people or their goodness or their godliness by the lights that they have i mean they're doing the right thing they've, they've come out to console um, mary and martha because their brother brother has died and there's a, probably would be a good place to digress but i'm not prepared to do it but did just Remind yourself how human beings are affected by death. You know, you read all through from the Old Testament through to the New Testament. Uh, death is a big deal. You know, uh, it's 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 uh, one thing we all have in common. It's it's the one thing about life that's certain. Right? And, 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 and people in in all cultures, I guess, in times and places, are really affected by death. It's a serious business. Certainly, the Jews were. I mean. You remember when after the, after the Jews had been slaves in, in, in Egypt for a long time, they got ready to leave. They collected up Joseph's bones and took them with them. Right? I mean, they, they, they prepared for the dead. You know, death is something that occupies the attention of Jewish people and all people. And they're here mourning, mourning death, and, and that's the background of, of what's happening. It's, it's a very real part of life that many of us have had some experience with already, you know, being around death and mourning, right? And the fact that these Jews who have come to comfort, you know, poor Martha and Mary because their brother is, is dead, you know, Martha and Mary receive a fair bit of attention in the Bible and basically all of it good. As far as we know, they have a, a loving, intimate relationship with, with Jesus and Jesus loves them. You know, they, and so they're good people and their friends might be by, by transitivity considered to be some of them quite good also, right? It might be a nice group of people who have come out to console Mary and Martha on the death of their brother there. So they're Jewish, 
And they're in Judea, near Jerusalem, and Jesus, Jesus has been having trouble with, with these people all along in the first ten chapters we've already studied. But the, the, the place Jesus is walking into isn't necessarily a bad gathering or an angry gathering. It's one that's doing what God commands, consoling people in, in times of, of grief, right? So I'm somewhat sympathetic towards this crowd, at least as I read it. I, you, you, you may be less so, I don't know. Okay, so in, in verse 20, it says, so that when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and, and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha went, but Mary remained seated in the house. All right, and so if you remember the story from Luke, Martha was the more active sister, right? She was the one that was busy cleaning the house and everything and, and angry because Mary was sitting there at Jesus' feet, right? And at that time, Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you know, you're, you're, you're missing the point, right? Mary has picked the, the better thing, right? But Martha has this reputation in the Bible of being the more, you know, active of the two sisters. And that, it, it seems that John and, and Luke had a similar recollection of her. Some people think John and Luke knew each other and, 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 and there's some even literary connection here. All right. Now, if you look at, at Luke 10, 38 through 41, why don't we look there? Some people might not remember that I hope I have the right, remember in the right place. Um, Steve, did you find it? You, would you read 38 through 41? Chapter 10, right, okay. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered the village. And the woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. So that's the story that we teach the children and remember ourselves last next week. We have some idea of Mary and Martha, right? Um, so I, I just wanted to stop here and ask you, you know, in light of what Steve just read, in, in Luke 10, 38 through 42, actually, he, he read, it should be 42, thank you. Um, does the fact that it, it's not surprising Martha's the one that leaps up and runs out of the house to go talk to Jesus, right? That's kind of what we think of, think of Martha being like. Do you see any significance in the fact that Mary remains seated in the house or not? I don't know the answer. It just, it just struck me that it might be interesting to think about. Well, why did they make that an important point? Why was it written? Well, no, I mean, well, that, there you go. I mean, it, John, John could have written a lot of stuff, and he decided to include this information, right? So it, it seemed like John and the Holy Spirit thought it was worth letting us know that Martha ran off and Mary stayed sitting in the house, right? I mean, why? I don't know the answer, but I think it's an interesting question. Does anybody have any thought about that? Yeah? This might come more from my experience with Japanese culture than the, the, the actual scriptures. But many, many cultures often <coughs> want someone to stay with a, with someone who has recently passed away that yeah, until yeah, a certain amount of time has passed, yeah, yeah. that the person's body is not left alone. Mm -hmm. That someone is always there. I don't know that much about Jewish culture though. That's yeah, but I think that if, if we read it, as we read ahead, we'll find out he's already behind the stone in the, in the tomb, and she's sitting in the house. I apologize. That was Martha's personality type, but I wonder why Mary didn't run out with her. Might be no, there might be no 
nothing to, to point to, but I, yeah, I, w I was just wondering if, like, in the other story, Mary remained seated also, right? And she remained seated with Jesus, kind of attending to what Jesus said while Martha was busy doing stuff. It just seemed to me here, Martha's again busy doing stuff. Maybe, I mean, maybe Mary was more settled in her faith than Jesus. Maybe she, she didn't think that she needed to be proactive and manage the Son of God to some, or, or something, I don't know. It's, it's interesting to think about, but... I don't think we'll ever know. But what we do see here is, is a picture similar to what we read in Luke of Martha going out to do something and Mary not, Mary staying and seated in the house with the people who had come to console them on the death of their brother. Okay, so Martha says to Jesus in verse 21, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. <laughs> that, of course, I, I don't know. I, I guess there can be different ways to read that. Precisely. With the intonation there could be, well, if you were here, he wouldn't have died. Right. Yeah. So that's what I want, wanted to ask is, how do, how do you understand what Martha first said to Jesus in, in Chapter 11, verse 21, if, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And it's like I was saying before, when you read the Bible, you can impart meaning with intonation, right? And this is one place where that's true, right? So what, what Wayne, not surprisingly, came up with the more cynical possibility first, <laughs> is, that, is, is that maybe it was an accusation, right? You could hear it in his voice, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Right? You can hear that. And down through the centuries, some Bible commentators have heard that and others not. Especially in light of verse 22. Yeah. Well, also, the, they were also witnessed. Well, but I, I, it's hard to, to, to jump around, but I mean, in verse 22, militates against this interpretation, would you say? Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. Also, in previous ones, you know, he had killed sick people before, so they knew that if he had got it while he was sick, he could have been cured. So they had that kind of faith that he could, they could he, he's a healer. Right, so see, I, I mean, regardless of the intonation that you hear, yeah. She, she knows Jesus had the power to, to heal. To heal right? yeah. I would suggest not just her. Jesus has done these signs. Jesus has just given sight to a man born blind. Right. Getting yeah. 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 to a guy 38 years on the to walk. Right? <laughs> Probably there's not many people in Palestine in that particular point in history who would put much past Jesus in, in the category of being able to heal stuff. Right? I mean, so she, she does at least have that faith and more, as, as we'll see, right? So it could be an accusation, but I, I don't think so. It could be an expression of regret. I says, oh, Lord, if you'd only been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. In which case, it wouldn't be a, any accusation of Jesus, just they share a love for Lazarus, and oh, how, it, too bad you're in the other Bethany. <laughs> because if you had been in this Bethany, Lazarus wouldn't, wouldn't have died, a kind of regret, right? Or it could be a kind of factual observation, right? I mean, Martha might be that kind of a person. Well, Lord, if you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died, you know, like... Just <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. If I hadn't left the laundry out, it would have gotten wet. I mean, <laughs> but it, it could be, right? I mean, it could be just a factual <laughs> observation and... In any case, and I, I can't tell you how to read your Bible. You, I mean, the Holy Spirit has to do that. But I can tell you you have to be careful about nuance and, and tone because in some places you'll get an entirely different meaning from the Bible depending on, on how you read it. Here, in any case, this is a statement of faith, right? I mean, she, as you've already said, she believed that Jesus had the power to heal such an illness as had recently resulted in the death of a brother Lazarus, right? She, she had no question about that. If Jesus had set himself to do it, of course he could have, he could have healed him, right? And Martha, though, knew a great deal more than that. And, and John is going to help us see that that wasn't all. She didn't just know, like many people then probably knew, 
Jesus could heal, right? The Pharisees, yes, even the ones that yes, wanted yes, to yes, kill him, yes, knew that he could give sight to people who were born blind, right? That's what's bugging them. Right? They don't know what category to drop him in, but they're, they're sort of not denying that, that he can do that kind of stuff. <coughs> so verse 22, as Mark pointed us already, says, but, this is the same thought continuing, but, even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you, right? So not only did Martha believe that Jesus had the power to heal fatal illnesses, but she also believed that he had the power to raise the dead. She and Mary have spent time with Jesus. They're intimately familiar with Jesus. And they've been positively affected through their relationship with Jesus. And Martha has come to the point where she understands he can cure fatal illnesses easy. But even now, she said, even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Even now, if you wanted to raise Lazarus from the dead, you could do it. You could ask God to do it, right? But the way that she says it demonstrates even more that she understands better than most people the nature of the signs that Jesus does. This isn't just some power that Jesus has to do amazing stuff. He says, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you, right? So she understands that whatever signs Jesus said he would perform, he would perform, right? She has never seen him fail. It doesn't enter her mind that Jesus might say, okay, I'll heal Lazarus and then not be able to do it. They've never seen that happen. Right? Ne- a lot of times his mom says, they're out of wine, and Jesus says, well, I'll what? what's your point? Right? <laughs> he doesn't do miracles on command. But when he says that he will do something, he always 100% of the time does it, right? That's the experience that Martha has had. So she has no question that if he were to purpose to do something, that, that it would happen. She's never seen him fail. She also understood that everything that Jesus did, as Jesus has taught in so many different ways, is something that he sees the Father do. What Jesus does, God does. What God does, Jesus does. The Father and I are one, is the last thing he said before they picked up stones to throw at him, right? So whatever Jesus is doing is stuff that God is, is also doing, and she knows that. Right? And she knows that God and everybody in Israel knows God is capable of doing anything, including even raising people from the dead. Right? So that's, that's how far her faith goes, at least as she understands that if, if Jesus were to ask God to raise Lazarus from the dead, it would happen. What I don't know, and I don't think we can tell from the Bible for sure, is did she expect that that's what Jesus would do now? It could like do, yeah, yeah, of course. And if you say you would, then definitely, right? But, but I didn't feel that way. I think it's a statement of fact, and that's why he had to reiterate the point. Do you believe this? Well, yeah, I don't, I don't pick up any signal here that tells me that she's necessarily expecting Jesus to raise Lazarus from, from the dead. Yeah. Do you? Well, if you look at her comment in verse 24, you know, she talks about, I know he's going to be raised again at the end. I mean, that makes it pretty clear. She's not thinking it's going to happen. I think you're right. But I think, I think one, of, one of the reasons why I think she's not expecting Jesus to just run over and tell Lazarus to come out of the tomb is that she already has a fairly high expectation about the final resurrection on the last day and all of that. Right? So, so yeah, I, I think we're, it seems to be the consensus and correctly that, that, that she's not necessarily expecting that Jesus is going to do what he, what he actually does do. And that's the way Jesus is, and that's the way God is, which is why you can believe that they're true, is they're always doing the unexpected thing, right? Jesus doesn't follow a formula. He doesn't heal according to a formula. He's always doing some strange thing that nobody ever expected him to do because he can. He's God, right? He's the sovereign Lord. He, he doesn't have to do everything the same way as people. Even his mother can't get him to do, to do you know, what she wants him to do just because she wants a miracle now. Okay, so maybe she's not expecting it. And then Jesus says to her in verse 23, your brother will rise again. All right, so she's expressed this huge faith in the power and effectiveness of Jesus' word. I, I believe that Martha believes that if Jesus said anything, 
it would happen. Okay. And now Jesus speaks, right? So the word of Jesus goes forth, and she's learned that whatever it, whatever it does, it does, right? I mean, she trusts that, Je- that Jesus has the power to, to, to speak things into existence, in a sense. And what Jesus says is that Lazarus will rise. <coughs> but again, what exactly does, does that mean, right? What exactly does Jesus mean? when he says that Lazarus will, will rise again, right? I mean, you, you have to suppose, if you go to a funeral and people are grieving over a lost loved one, what does anybody say, right? They'll rise again. These are religious people. <laughs> These are Pharisee Jews, you know, as I'll say in a minute. I mean, so Jesus could just mean to reassure her, to remind her of what all people of faith in Israel of the Pharisee, Pharisee persuasion anyway believe is that on the last day Lazarus <coughs> will rise again, right? And so that's what she says. She says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. All right. So that's one of the things that Jesus might have meant by the words that he just spoke. When Jesus said Lazarus will rise again, he might only have meant that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And he's just a, a, a good rabbi reminding, you know, rabbi. Martha, he, he is, I mean, they call him rabbi, right? He, right through this section, they still call him teacher. You know, it's, it's, he could just be reminding, reminding her of what the word of God says. You know, that, that's part of their faith already is, right? So, and that wouldn't have been, if that's, you know, if that's, uh, you know, if that's, I think that's part at least of the meaning of what Jesus says, right? And not the, and not, and not the, and not the least important part. So I, I just wanted to catch this point. Which is important for, if you're Lazarus, if you're Martha and Mary? Which is important? To know that Lazarus will rise on the last day and live eternally in the kingdom of God? Or to know that he's going to come out of the tomb and live for a few more years and die? Which, which is, which is right? Yeah, the other one. The other first, right? Yeah. So if, if Jesus, and Jesus, she must have been familiar with the very high teaching of Jesus, you know, she, she might just think that Jesus was reminding her about eternal life. Yeah, the resurrection of the last day. And, and not even suspecting he's not going to be actually pulling Lazarus out of the tomb right now, right? And if that's all he meant, if you have to pick one or the other, you'd pick this, right? You pick eternal life over coming out of the tomb for another few decades of life. What, what were you going to say, somebody? Mark? Ricky, were you trying to say something? Uh, you, you had already made the point that you kept talking. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, well, the, well, but you know, when, when Jesus defined what kind of sleep that Lazarus was in, and then he stopped short and said he will rise again, then he talked about the latter, uh, the first, the second point that you made. You know, he was, you get in a little definition of what kind of rising. Yeah. So that might have been what Jesus meant. And Martha says to him, I know that. Okay. Right? Because this faith and resurrection on the last day, I read, I, I'm no expert on this stuff, but I read it in a book that this was a central tenet of Pharisaic Ju- Judaism. You asked this question last week or the week before. What did they believe? And I said, there's a wide spectrum of belief among Jews regarding eternal life, right? even in that sense. But the Jews that have been harassing Jesus most recently, the Pharisees, had as, as a kind of a fixed central tenet of their belief that, that they would rise on the last day. Right? So that's the tradition that they're operating in. That might have been all that Jesus meant to say. But it's also a central tenet of Christianity that believers will rise on the last day, right? And so I think that in everything Martha said so far anyway, there's nothing wrong with what she said. And there's a lot right in what Martha has, has said so far. Right? She's expressed a great deal of faith in Jesus and nothing that I could really find, find fault with. But what we don't know yet, and Jesus is going to make plain, is whether or not there's a connection in her mind between resurrection on the last day which a belief which she would share with the Pharisees that were there to comfort her, um, and Jesus. Right. What's the connection between those things? So Jesus says to her, and this sets up a lot of what follows, Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. 
Right. So many of the Jews gathered in Martha's home would have agreed with what she's just said in verse 24 about resurrection on the last day. That's a belief that they held in common. But very few of the people there would have accepted what comes next, namely that the resurrection and eternal life come through faith in Jesus. That's exactly the thing that they're, that they're not accepting. Right? Jesus says, whoever believes in, the, in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. Right. So it's believers in Jesus who die and then live again. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Believers in Jesus die and live again. Right? And that's what Jesus means then when he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He identifies himself with the resurrection and life eternal because it belongs to those who believe in him. He said the same thing with the figure of the sheepfold. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life in the sheep. If we have time tonight, we'll go back to chapter 5 where there's an extended commentary on John already where, where Jesus explains these, these same ideas um, in, in greater detail. So it's faith in Jesus that leads to resurrection and eternal life. So why did Jesus say this stuff to, to Martha? I'm asking, he said to her, I am the resurrection and life, whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And the answer is what? Why, why Jesus says that, says that to her? It's maybe not a very good question. I mean, I mean yeah. Well, if you wanted to uh, get a confession of faith from her. Yeah, and, and at the end of the next verse, which, which makes it an awkward question, he's going to say, do you believe this? Right. So he's trying to, to find out the content of her faith. She has a great deal of faith in Jesus. She understands his relationship with God. She knows his power. She knows that he could raise the dead. A lot of stuff she knows. She, she believes in resurrection on the last day. But the question, the readers at least, have or you know Jesus ultimately knows these things right but 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 the, but the question that Martha needs to find out and readers need to find out is is the content of her faith does she understand that Jesus is the door of the sheep <coughs> Jesus continues in verse 26 it says everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die do you believe this All right, that's his reason for asking the question because he wants to find out if she believes this. I have to say, maybe it's obvious to everyone, I don't think when, when God or his son ask a question, it's, it's ever a real question in the sense that they're looking for information. Yeah. The, the question is for the benefit of the person who answers it, right? When, you know, when, when, when God tells Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, God knows what will happen, right? Abraham doesn't know what will happen, right? So, so, you know, when, when, when God is asking a question, when Jesus is asking a question, he wants Martha to know what she believes, and he wants us to know what she believes, right? So, before verse 25, Jesus has said that believers who die shall live again. Now he says believers shall never die. So, I think it's not hard for most of you guys, but how do you reconcile these two statements? Believers who die shall live again. Believers shall never die. You hear this, these two verses quoted at almost every funeral that you go to, right? Um, how, do you sort, how do you keep that straight in your mind? Say, believers shall never die. Believers who die shall live again. So, Let's just walk through it, you know, piece by piece. So, in what sense do believers in Christ die? The physical body. Right. So our bodies die, right? So everybody's bodies die. Jews and Gentiles, Christians, non-Christians, Muslims. In fact, Jesus died. Jesus' body died. And so part of being a human being is your body dies. Right? Okay. So when we say that. The Christians die, we mean that, that our bodies die, right? So in what sense is it that Christians, Christian believers never die? Well, 
Because in the in the immediate moment upon physical death, you no, you are immediately into the, the kingdom realm as so the man who died on the cross of Jesus says, so today you'll be in the paradise. Okay, so there's something that's you that survives your physical death, it sounds like you're saying, right? Anybody else have a different way to say? I uh, I thought this was an interesting way when it was taught to me. You know, I've always thought of eternal life as when you die, that's when your eternal life begins. But instead of that, I like to view when you accept Christ, that's when your eternal life starts. You know, right now, as Christians, we're living our eternal life. Right, that's an important, that's an, an important insight. So you're... you're Your answer is the same, in, in other words, right? You're saying that once you accept Christ, you're Jesus living in a way that continues beyond the physical death of your body. Or, or actually, the physical <laughs> death of your body is, is a minor yeah. detail. Yeah. Yeah. It, it does, it's not so interesting, <laughs> because you're already living eternally from the time you so that's, that's a way to, to, to answer, a good way to answer. Anybody else? Right. And, and part of a different way of saying both of those things is that we do as Christians believe in something called the soul which lives forever right? there's, there's part of us which is eternal and it, it lives beyond the death of, of our physical our physical body right and it's not harmed by the death of our physical body so like, like he said once you accept Jesus you've already in some sense entered into eternal life a life that will continue forever including beyond the, the physical death of your body and even on into something else, and that's the last question to untangle this thing, to peel this onion, is in what sense do believers in Christ rise? Because that's also part of what Jesus is just said. Right? So we understand our bodies died, we understand that our souls don't die. In what sense do we rise again? Jesus said if believers yet they die, yet they'll live, right? So, how would you answer that? Well, we would commonly say that we, we would be, we would come to the, we have to go through the cross and come out, you know, oh, so it leads, to, it leads to another question which may have, may go, go with that question, right? Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He didn't say, I am the resurrection life, because he isn't yet. So with the and the life part be that he is the source of life as well as resurrection? Or that it's the life after resurrection, or both? Yeah, you know, because while he's on earth, but before that, he, he is, you know, the life. But yeah. not quite the resurrection life. Yeah, I guess I guess I don't. I don't. That's all true. As far as I know, that's everything you said is true. Um, but the the thing is, Christians do believe also in the bodily resurrection in the last day, and it's it's part of what we tend to forget. Um, it's part of the most ancient creeds of Christendom. You know, the Apostles' Creed. You know, profess the faith in resurrection, in, in so resurrection of the body, life yeah, everlasting. Right? So, what Martha first said, and what the Pharisee and Jews already believed, that on the last day, Lazarus will rise, is true of all Christians. For sure. On the last day, you're going to rise bodily. What kind of body it is, and all of that, don't ask. It's tricky, right? But it, it is, it is a bodily resurrection. You don't exist forever as a disembodied soul. Right. Um, you know, as a believer in Christ, like Jesus, who was the first of us to do this, Jesus rose from the dead bodily, right? And, and so, so will we, um, you know, when he comes again. And so that, that's, I think, that the traditional or orthodox view in, in the Christian world is all of us die, of course, right? Our bodies die. Our immortal soul is immortal. It doesn't die. And if, we're, if, we're, if we have life in Christ, our death is nothing but good. You know, it's a step in the direction of, of, a better, of a better way, right? That goes beyond this life. And yet still, and this is mysterious, but an important part, I think, of Christian faith is that there will, in the end, be a bodily resurrection. Right? Our eternal life is, in some sense, a bodily life, but we, we don't understand that much about what it will be like. 
What is it that, that John says in 1 John? What, what we will be hasn't yet been seen, but what we know is that when we see him, we'll be like him, right? Because mm-hmm. we'll see him face to face. We'll be like Jesus. Yeah, in eternity, Jesus, Jesus rose bodily from the dead. You can read 1 Corinthians chapter 15 later if you're interested. Okay, so we'll, we'll rise bodily on the last day. So to review, believers in Christ, bodies die just like Jesus did. Believers in Christ's souls live forever and aren't harmed by the death of their body. No Christian should fear death at all. It's just a step in, in a good direction. And on the last day in ways that aren't, aren't all that well known by us, but as we studied in the Revelation to John, and you can read elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 15 and other places, is we do expect there to be a resurrection of the body in life everlasting. So that eternity will be at least like our current reality in that sense, that we're going to be in the body. そうだったら、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、そのように、その
そして傷跡に手の際と大きくが見えます、ね、<笑>そして傷の後に自分の指を差し込んでみなければ自分は信じないと言ったんです and place my hand into his side I will never believe 自分の指をこう傷跡にあの、ね、差し込んでみるまでは自分はそのイエスの復活を信じないとトマスは言いました Eight days later, his disciples would sign again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. That might not be our concept of a perfect body. One of the other hands. I was pointing out. That's what I was pointing out what the scripture says here. I know. Actually, but that's actually Thomas who's putting his own expectations. How Jesus. Is going to be. And it's dangerous for us to put our own expectations on it. Yeah, yes. so I mean, he's actually expecting that Jesus is supposed to have nails there.、Mm-hmm. Other people will expect that they aren't going to be there. But Jesus anticipated it. Yeah. Well, but that's also somewhat how God works. What have I done? He anticipated it. So, <laughs> I, 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 mean, I think that the, the Thomas passage, Thomas wanted to be sure that, that it was really the Jesus. The、Jesus that he knew who had actually risen, right? And so for Thomas to believe it, he had to make a connection between the, the risen Jesus standing there and the one that he knew who had been crucified, right? And so I, I think that's, that's that story. Thomas is making sure that this is really Jesus, right? Which is kind of a different point than Kenji's point, which is what will our heavenly body be like, but nobody knows, right?、Yeah. But, but, but I think I, I was thinking the same thing Steve said when, when, when、uh, Kenji asked that question. Was, I mean, Thomas was, he, he, in a sense, he was expecting to see that. that Jesus would have,、uh, okay, you know, it could be for identity, but I think that's also the reason is it's identity. So God. When he comes and, and catches us, when, when we act in faith, it's because we can identify. Because there was another passage in the other gospel where he walked with two people on the road. And then they could not recognize him, but they said, But then our hearts burn. その時の彼らの二人の弟子たちの目が下がれていたっていうかちゃんと、ね、あの見ることができなかったということだと思うんですけどもつまり識別できなかったイエスだって分かっていた。It'll just be so much better than anything we can imagine. We can never have the heavenly body unless the earthly body dies first. そしてもうこの青鳥バニーっていう地上の体は死ぬんですね。でも代わりに天の体をいただく
そっちの方がはるかにまちまちだけです。それはパウロがもう書いてます。だから聖書に入っていますこの体は死ぬというふうに書いてあるんですね。これは死ぬというふうに書いてあるんですね。The body that lives forever has to be very different than the body that lives forever. But while God is trying to talk to us human beings now, He, he can only talk to us using words we can understand, symbols we can understand. Marks of identification that we can understand, right? And so, For Thomas, for example, God has been not very l o v e to communicate with people in a way that they can understand, right? And Thomas needed. And so God gave him that. Somebody else might not need that, right? The Apostle Paul or John or somebody might have a different way of It's kind of what you were saying. Yeah. Okay,、um, all right, so let's finish up quickly. Verse 26 says, Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And now Jesus, like somebody, several people already said, Jesus is waiting for Martha to answer, right? He, he, he's got to find out i f she's caught up to the teaching that we've received in 10 plus chapters of John. Does she believe he is the door of the sheep, as he himself was t a u g h t She believes there's a resurrection on the last day. She believes that, she, that Lazarus can come back. She believes that Jesus has power in this world to do all kinds of amazing signs and miracles and stuff like that. But does she believe what Jesus is teaching here, which is he is the resurrection and the life, that he is the one door to, he's the one, one way, right, to the resurrection of the dead? Does, does she believe that? Right, that he's the one way. And she says to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Which means her short answer is yes, you know. I, th- I think of myself, all the things that I know, or I'm confused about, or I do, or I don't know about the kingdom of God and heavenly bodies and all of that. But if Jesus came, he said, Do you believe me? I would hope I would say, Yes. <laughs> I, I, I believe you, right? Do I understand all of these things? No. Right? No, I, I don't understand everything. Many things I'm confused about. But could I, could I believe that Jesus is, is the door of the sheep, the only way to eternal life? Yes, I, I do believe that. Right? And she's shown already she believes in his ability to perform miraculous signs and his relationship to God. She now says that she believes that he's the one who was foretold, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. Who finally is coming into the world, right, to save those who are going to hear his voice and follow him. She, she, she believes a lot.、Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, those are my words. I mean, you, you should focus on hers, but she, her, her words are Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. And what I, what I pick up from this is that although, just like anyone, her. her Her faith could have imperfection, right? And stuff missing, stuff she doesn't understand yet. But she understands a lot about Jesus. And she understands enough, I think. Right. All right. And so I, I want, I'm going to have to. Finish quickly. I was going to have more time for discussion, but just by asking you guys, do you think even at this point, verse 27 now, d o e s she, she, she expect Jesus is going to presently and physically raise Lazarus from the grave? And I think we're tending to think no, right?、Yeah. So she's probably going to be a little bit surprised when she sees what Jesus does. And I wanted you guys to think about does Lazarus himself derive any benefit from being called back from the grave? Uh, <laughs> no, right? I mean, it's like kind of a bad deal. He's already. <laughs> he's already he John Calvin says、that. death, in a way, is an escape from death. Be- because once our body dies, we escape this living death that we have as sinners in this world, right? I mean, for, for a believer, death is, is a pathway to a better place, right? So Lazarus has already <laughs> checked out, right? <laughs> and he's coming back again. And I, I can't think of any reason off, offhand. To say that, you know, that, that it's beneficial to him, at least the reason to bring him back, I, I, I dare say, is, is not for his benefit, but for, the, but for the benefit of people who 
will follow, right? And Jesus said before they left Judea across the Jordan, I'm glad that I wasn't there when Lazarus died because this will help your faith. Right? He said to his disciples. And so the beneficiaries of what Jesus is about to do next is not Lazarus, right? But the people whose faith will be strengthened by what they see Jesus do. Right? So if people see this great and last, the seventh sign of Jesus actually raising someone from the dead, it's like all of the six signs that went before it. The purpose is not to do something amazing. The purpose is to point people, as the sign goes, to Jesus and faith leading to eternal life. The people who receive that kind of faith because of this sign are going to be the ones who benefit from it. And if I could just suggest you guys in your spare time read again chapter 5 verses 16 through 29 where Jesus is talking about how he overcomes death. And think about the fact, and then we'll come back to this more next week, that the raising of Lazarus is only a sign. You know, the point of it is, is not to help Lazarus by bringing him back from the dead. The point of it is to help people of all times by leading them into faith in Jesus Christ and eternal life, right? Just like the other six signs. Changing water into wine, raising Lazarus from the dead, both have the same objective, leading people to Jesus and eternal life. And but because Jesus is actually calling someone dead into life, it's a kind of inactive parable of Jesus' power. I apologize for the time being ten minutes over.